In Romans chapter 6, we learn a lot about what baptism is. Now, there are other places in Scripture that talk about baptism and, and what baptism is. When uh, John the Baptist, or as some would call him the baptizer, because uh, the Baptist denomination did not exist <laughs> in the first century. I uh, hope that's not news to you. <laughs> hope that doesn't surprise you too much. But uh, John the baptizer, why was he called that? Because he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. It was called a baptism of repentance. And uh, there were times where people would come to John and he would actually question them. And there was a group of Pharisees that came to, to be baptized and he asked them questions like, he asked them, he says, because he knew who they were. He knew the way they were living. He's like, who warned you? He calls them a brood of vipers, a bunch of baby snakes. He says, you baby snakes, who warned you of the coming wrath? And then he says, uh, and don't say to yourselves, well, we're sons of Abraham. He says, for God can from these stones raise up children of Abraham. Right? That's how election works. That's how being chosen works. God chooses who he wills. Right? It's not up to man who wills or runs, but God who has mercy. And so John says to them, if you come to be baptized, that's, that's fine and good, but you need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. There is a way that you ought to live now that you have been baptized. And so uh, we baptize people who present themselves, who say, I have come to faith in Jesus Christ I am making a public profession of faith in Christ and I desire to be baptized as a sign, an outward symbol of an inward change. This is what has happened in my life. Jesus has saved me and in the same way that Jesus was crucified, dead and buried and rose again, so I have identified with him in his death and also I am identifying with him in his resurrection. And so the Bible teaches us about baptism, the way that we are to baptize, the people that we are to baptize, the way that when we are baptized, we are to think about our new life in Christ. And so I hope this is encouraging to you. It may be challenging to you, but I hope most of all that it just undergirds and supports, Jayla, what you are doing today in being baptized before this body and before the Lord and before the world Baptism is a picture of the resurrected life. A life that has been buried with Christ and risen to new life. In Romans chapter 5, Paul gives great news. <laughs> he says in Romans 5, 8, one of my favorite verses of all scripture, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love that verse. It means so much to me. It reminds me of the way that I am who I am today. It's because of what God has done. It's not because of what Luke has done. I have done nothing in view of what God has done for me in Christ. And the awesome thing is, it's not that, it's not that the gospel says that God did these things for you because you tried really hard. Or you did a lot better in this new phase of your life. I hear people all the time talk about baptism this way. Well, I'm turning over a new leaf. I'm kind of hitting the reset button. Kind of like a New Year's resolution, right? I just, I just really think I need to be baptized. I think if I can be baptized and kind of start over, I can do better. That's not what baptism is. You can't start over, right? We all have a record. We all have a past, Right? You're going, to have to, you're going to have to live with that. But you can live with your past. You can live with your record knowing that Jesus died in your place and he paid the price for all of that sin. For whatever is on your record. But I love verse 8 in Romans 5 because it says that it wasn't while we were righteous. It wasn't while we were doing a little bit of a better job. It wasn't while we were progressing. We just hadn't made it across the finish line yet. What does it say? While we were yet what? Sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ. Now let's just take that for a moment. Christ, who is he? He's the spotless, sinless son of God. Never did wrong. 
perfect, holy. He's the one, the Bible tells us in Romans 11, through which everything that you see, everything that was created, it was created through him, it was created by him, it was created for him. You get that? The Bible tells us in Philippians 2 that one day, even though every knee is not bowing today, one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because this is all for him. It all belongs to him. He has rights over everything. He has a right over your life, whether you acknowledge it or not. There are two types of God's sovereignty the scripture talks about. One is his absolute sovereignty. The nations rage. People live however they want to. But God has, through Christ, an absolute sovereignty over this world. And then there's an appropriated sovereignty. There is the, the souls in this world who have lived from the time of creation to the time of Christ's return who chose, who chose to bend their knee in their lifetime and say, you are my Lord. I am giving, I am surrendering everything to you. I'm no longer in charge of my life. I'm no longer the boss. I'm no longer calling the shots. You are. I submit myself to you. I give my life to you. That's appropriated sovereignty. Now whether or not you or I have appropriated God's sovereignty in our life has no bearing all over whether he is absolutely sovereign. But he gives us a moment today. He gives us a moment now to appropriate his sovereignty in our life. And to voluntarily be overcome with his kindness in the gospel and say, yes, Lord. He extends that invitation to us all the time. And so, because of the greatness of his grace, because his grace has overwhelmed the law of sin and death, he says in chapter 5, he says, what that, the greatness of God's love and the greatness of his mercy and the greatness of his grace might cause people who have been saved by his grace to think... Verse 1 of chapter 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace might increase? Is that the way it works? If God's grace overcame the law, if God's grace overcomes our sin, should we continue in sin so that if sin increases in our life, grace increases even more. Paul says in the Greek, meganoita, it's emphatic. Heck no, I'm cleaning it up for you. If he could have said that, he would have. He said, may it never be. That's what my New American Standard Version says. Verse 2, may it never be. No. No. There, there is no case, there's no case in which a born-again Christian would think that now that I'm born again, now that I'm covered by God's grace, I should continue to play with sin, to meddle in sin, because I know God's grace has got me covered. There's not a single believer who should live that way, he says here. May it never be. May it never be. And then he reminds us about the spiritual truths behind our baptism. Behind being buried, being immersed in the water and coming up again. He says in verse 2, if you notice, may it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now we're going to read all the way through verse 14. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of death might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Now verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once 
for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. First thing I want you to see from this passage is that he describes a new condition. As one who has been buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in new life, you and I have a new condition. We are alive and walking. Alive and walking. Notice what he says here in verses 1 through 5. You've been baptized into Christ Jesus. Verse 3. You have been baptized into his death. Verse 4. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Why? In order that... As Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might, what? Walk. Walk in newness of life. There is action expected on the part of believers once you are buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk. You are raised to walk in new life. It's God's desire. For you. We see it in Ephesians 4. Hold your place there in Romans 6. Turn over to the right, a little further into the New Testament. We're going to look at Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, where he compares the way that we used to walk with the way we should walk now. He also compares the way that the nations, the way that the world works, the way that the world walks, the average person, he compares and contrasts that with the way that you and I should walk as Christians. Now, starting in verse 17 of Ephesians 4, he says this, I say therefore and affirm together with the Lord that you what? Walk. That you walk no longer as the nations also walk in the futility of their mind, that is, their worldview is so jacked up because they don't know Jesus that they just continue to live by the same morals, the same ethics, the same everything that the world does because they haven't been changed. Not only have they not been changed, he says later on in verse 20, well, let's just, let's just go to verse 18. Being darkened in their understanding, talk about the, the nations, the world, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Their hearts haven't been pierced by the gospel. And if your heart hasn't been pierced by the gospel, if, if, if you see Jesus hanging on a cross and you say, nah, I don't need him. Doesn't affect me. Knowing that God sent his only son to die on the cross for me does not affect me. If that doesn't affect your heart, guess what? Your mind will never change. When we're praying for our loved ones who don't believe in God, and we think, oh, they just, got it, they just got it up here. They got it up here wrong. No, nope. it starts here. And then once you submit to the Lord, he gives you understanding in time. That's how it works. But Paul is not talking to the nations. He's talking to the church. He's talking to believers, those who have been baptized. And he says, you're not like the nations. You shouldn't walk like them. You're not darkened in your understanding anymore. Your heart, your heart is not hard anymore. You've been softened by the gospel. You now have new understanding of what life is all about. Verse 20. You did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you've heard him and have been taught in him. That in reference of your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. You be renewed in the spirit of your mind, he says in verse 23. And you put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness to the truth. He goes on 
to say those of you who, who, who used to steal, don't steal anymore. Those of you who used to cheat, don't cheat anymore. Don't continue to live the way the world operates. You've been changed in the heart and in the mind. And then he says in chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God. Imitate God. I meet people who are like, yeah, I don't want to get too serious about my faith, you know, reading the Bible and like, you know, being all crazy, praying. The Bible's pretty clear. <laughs> you should want to be as much as you can like Jesus. That shouldn't scare you. And if people don't like you because of that, because they're like, oh, you're all holier than thou. So, yeah, I'm I am, yes, I'm trying to be holy like Jesus. I'm trying to be set apart and it's a battle for me. And I don't think I'm better than you. No, because I can go back to Romans 5, 8 again. It was while I was still a sinner that Christ died for me. And I'm still a sinner today. Amen? But I walk by His grace through faith. Be imitators of God, the Bible says. And then he says this. This is really going to set your hair on fire if you have hair. Verse 10 he says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do you see that? This is the way you and I should live as believers. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Some may say that's holier than thou. Okay, whatever you want to call it. But I'm going to try to live in a way that pleases the Lord. There's a new walk that is expected of you and me when we see and behold Jesus hanging on a cross that God himself would come down in the flesh, would condescend so lowly just for me and just for you sinners. He died on the cross for us. Can we not put one foot in front of the other for him and live unto him? And try to learn what is pleasing to him. Try hard to know what is pleasing to him. That should be the entire focus of our life. Not to just have a relationship with God on the side. And then live my life in a way that pleases me. That is not the Christian way. That is not the way of Christ. There's a new condition. Alive. And not sitting, not being lazy, not being ignorant, but alive and walking, purposeful, trying to, plead, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Secondly, there's a new identity, a new identity. We are no longer slaves. You get that? We are no longer slaves. Verse 6 through 11. We walk in a new way, in the way of his resurrection, knowing this, verse 6, knowing that our old self was crucified with him. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Our old self was crucified with him that our body of sin might be done away with. Do you get that? In the, in the Greek, these are called henna clauses. In order that, in order that. They're just, they're like links to a chain that connect one thought to another. This happened so that this, or in order that this thing. Do you notice it there in verse 6? Our old self was crucified with him that our body of sin might be done away with. There is purpose in this truth. Amen? That we should no longer be, what? Slaves to sin. Before Jesus, before the Holy Spirit comes into our heart and changes us and radically transforms our life, we are slaves. We're slaves to sin. Before the gospel opens up our eyes and illuminates our spiritual sight, we are slaves. But once we are in Christ and our eyes have been opened and our hearts have been changed, we are no longer slaves. We have a new identity. Verse 7, For he who has died is 
freed from sin. Freed from sin. Now, verse 8, he says, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Do you see that? When we're buried with Christ in baptism, we're raised to new life. We demonstrate that truth that we now have life everlasting. Jesus is never to die again. He died once for all sins. And when he rose again, the Bible says he was declared the Son of God with power. That means that let everybody be assured who's ever lived and who will ever live on the face of this planet who's been affected by sin. By the way, that's all of us. Jesus rose again. That means he's, he's not like us. <laughs> he's sinless. He defeated sin. He defeated death. And he will never die again. Death is not master over him. And for all of those who've been buried with Christ and raised to walk a new life, we have that same relationship to sin that he has. We still struggle with it because we're not like him in that way, but we're no longer slaves to sin. Verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You're no longer a slave. You say, well, that that sounds good. But man, it is hard to live the life of a believer and not feel like I am a slave to my sin. I keep doing the same things. I have the same weaknesses. I have weaknesses that other people don't have. I have temptations that other people don't have. You, you don't understand my battle. I may not understand your battle. People around you might not understand your specific temptation. But it doesn't matter what your weakness is or what the sin is that besets you on a regular basis. The Bible is very clear, brothers and sisters, that Jesus died and rose again and is victorious over everything. And you have been freed once and for all of your sin through faith in him. But it's difficult to realize that in the Christian life, isn't it? It's difficult to live in that victory. One thing that we can do as believers and that I would encourage you to do, Jayla, is to enlist the help of other Christians to help you overcome the tendency to revert back to old habits and ongoing temptations. Hebrews 12 describes these things as encumbrances like obstacles, that are before your feet that can trip you up, remove them. If you know what they are, look ahead, enlist the help of others. This is why it's so important to be part of a Christian community like a church. And even even in our church, we have small groups where you get to know people a little bit more, a little bit closer. Enlist the help of other believers who also know the Lord. They need to know the Lord. So they know how to encourage you in your faith and to keep pouring. Not long ago, a couple weeks ago, I was just feeling really down. I have a really close friend who I called and we were talking and, and usually we kind of commiserate, you know. I'll share with him some of the things I'm struggling with and he'll share some things he's struggling with. And we're like, well, you know, let's pray for each other. And, and this day he had just come back from a retreat and he was like lit on fire, Right? He had just gotten away and just kind of refocused on the word and allowed the gospel just pour over his heart. And so when I called him, I said, man, I'm struggling here, some things. I'm, and, and he just heaped the gospel all over me. And I'm driving. And I've just got tears coming down my face. Thanking God for such a friend. Man, that's what we all need. If you don't have friends like that, you've got to get around people like that who are going to encourage you because you can't do it by, your, by yourself. You have a new identity. You're no longer a slave. There are others, other freed people who can come alongside you, enlist their help. Proverbs 27, 5 through 6. 
It says, better is an open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. You need the type of friends that will heap the gospel on you and not let you make excuses for your sin. A friend that might wound you. Friends that might tell you what you don't want to hear so that you defeat the sin in your life. So that you kill it. Those are the types of friends you need. But the enemy will give you all kinds of other friends. Co-workers, people that you go to school with, people that you encounter in your family who will just pacify you and keep you feeling good about yourself, right? Oh, you got this. Keep going. Keep going, brother. Keep going, you know, sister, whatever. And, and not tell you the truth. And not tell you the truth about your sin and your ongoing need for a savior and the grace that's always awaiting you. They'll turn you back to yourself and tell you, well, just believe in yourself. Look into yourself. You have what it takes. Those are all dead ends. If your friends don't turn your eyes upon Jesus, they don't have your good intentions in mind. Good friends will help you live like someone set free from sin. Anyone who helps you feel better about sinning and more comfortable as a slave to sin, is not a friend. They may be nicer. They may even have a better personality than all your Christian friends, <laughs> which is sometimes the case. But they will lead you away from the Savior and they will lead you back to slavery every time. It's a challenge. Finally, we see that we have new authority. This goes hand in hand with this idea of slavery. Starting in verse 12. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. I want you to notice the language here that the Holy Spirit uses. It all has to do with this idea of authority. Don't let sin reign because you have a new master. You have a new master. See, Jesus, when, when, he, when he comes on the scene and people flock to him, they want to see him as a great teacher. Man, I want to have, I listened to him teach once. And I was taking notes. And I got my Jesus rabbi book in my back pocket. And I post memes about Jesus, the teacher. Very wise, very smart guy. I like him. He's a, he's a sage, you know, a lot of wisdom. Jesus would not allow people and he doesn't allow people today to think of him that way. He's either your Savior and Lord or he's not. That word Lord in the Greek kurios means master. It means someone who we report to on a daily basis. Someone who we've turned our entire lives over. He is the boss of my life. When our kids were little and they would ask questions about, you know, being saved and wondering about their relationship with God. And that's one of the things that lordship, they're like, we're not like, you know, 17th century Great Britain. You know, we don't use the word lord. Kids don't walk into the house and, hello, my lord, you know, and what's for dinner, <laughs> you know. It's, uh, so we, we didn't use the word lord very much. It's like it means you're making Jesus the boss of your life. Oh, they get the boss. <laughs> they get boss, right? They tell each other, you're not the boss of me. That's what it means. A new authority, a new boss. He lays out the plan for your life. And so as we live day to day, we are constantly seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, knowing that he will provide everything that we need. That's what the Lord's Prayer is all about. You know that, right? Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, we look to you for our sustenance. That's it. And Lord, if you provide what we need, we're going to follow you every step of the way. We don't have to know what tomorrow brings. We don't have to have everything planned out. We don't have to have control. We don't want control. We want you to have it. Daniel testified about that just a while ago. He says, I'm getting in the trunk. I'm going to let God drive the car. God is master and grace is the relationship dynamic. See, with Sin as the master, there is no grace in that relationship. None. It's law all the time. 
And the Bible says when it comes to the law, you and I are lawbreakers. But in this new relationship with God as your authority, through Christ, he says, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. This is the idea of of someone who has a master who reports for duty every day and comes and says, here I am. He says, when you used to live as sin as your master, you used to bring your body. You used to submit your body to sin and say, use me however you want. And usually it feels really good to the flesh. That's what we used to do. He said, but now that you're in Christ, you've been buried with Christ in baptism, you've died to self, you've put on the new self, now you don't report for duty to sin, saying, well, I'm just a slave. All I can do is sin. So just tell me what you want me to do. No. No, now that God is your master through grace, you don't present the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but now, he says, present yourselves to God as those, as those who have been made alive from the dead with thanksgiving and joy and amazement at God's grace. Now show up for duty with tears in your eyes and and joy to say, Lord, do whatever you want with me. Because now I have been set free. I have been made alive. Paul says here, this is the way you're to report for duty every day. With joy. Not in defeat. But with joyful anticipation that God would use you for his glory. As those alive from the dead. Your members as instruments of righteousness to God for sin verse 14 says shall not be master over you ever again (laughs) for you are not under the law you are under grace Galatians 5 1 says brothers it is for freedom that Christ has set you free live in that freedom Allow God's grace, submit yourself to the Lord and live in such a way that is reflective of the great grace by which you have been saved. Amen? And if you've never been born again, if you've never submitted yourself to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Bible makes it very clear and simple that when you hear the good news of the gospel which you've heard today, That Jesus Christ died for your sins. He's the son of God. He died on the cross for your sins. So that you might have life eternal. That you might be freed from your sin. It's all by grace through faith. If you believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, God will save you. If you're willing to say, I'm done. I'm done with the slavery to sin. I'm done with the world. I'm done. I'm maxed out. I want Christ, I want new life, I want resurrection life. The Bible says that if you only trust him, he will save you. There's nothing else that you can bring to the table. It's just to receive that free gift of eternal life. And you can do that today. I invite you to do it as we pray. We're going to pray in just a moment. And then we're all going to head outside. I think the baptistry is ready. Water's been baking in the sun a little bit. Be nice and warm. We'll go out there and uh, we will just see a beautiful picture of God's grace on display. But if you've never trusted in him for salvation, do it today. And let somebody know. Let somebody know that you've put your trust in Christ 